The uh, Vivosonic Integrity Generation 2. This is a new generation of equipment for this company. It's a Canadian company. And I've known them from the very beginning when they first started in, uh, in audiology. And they've come a long way. They're small enough that you can call up there and you can get the, uh, uh, the chief engineer on the phone uh, within uh, one minute. And, uh, uh, and so you get, we get a lot of personal service out of them. And this has become more and more popular. And today, it is one of the most popular evoke potential systems. And I had the opportunity to do some of the beta testing on this, to do clinical trials on it, uh, and also to do performance comparisons with other pieces of equipment that have been on the market for uh, quite a while, um, almost all of which I'm, I'm very familiar with because they've been out, uh, they've been out for some time. So um, one thing that is unique about this is it gets, it gets beautiful waveforms and you're able to record those very quickly. And it's got some, some uh, unique technology in it that makes that possible. This is, this is a latency intensity function. Uh, it's 85 dB, 75 dB, 65 and, and 45. Uh, 65, 55 and 45. And uh, notice that the last one, when I did 45 dB, uh, I, I wanted to make sure it replicated. And uh, one of the nice things that this piece of equipment does, it's always recording two waveforms in the background. Uh, the, uh, the, re the response from one click goes in memory A. The response from the next click goes in memory B. So A, B, A, B. And you end up with two being uh, recorded in the background. And what you see is the average of the two. And there's nothing wrong with that, but the beauty of it is if you want to see if any response replicates, all you've got to do is hit one button, which the AB button, and then, like I did here, I didn't have to record multiple recordings. I just recorded one, and when I wanted to pull up my other two to make sure that everything replicated, then all I do is hit one button and I have those available. And I can put them on at any time on any of these waveforms or shut them off. It's something that saves a lot of time. It could cut the time in half because almost always you don't have to do a replication run. So that's how you'll save time with that feature. Uh, this is a, an ECOG that I collected on my left ear. In a minute I'll show you my audiogram for the left ear. I used to be autologically perfect, however, <laughs> little by little that has changed lately. Anyway, this is, this is my ECOG on my left ear. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of clinics tell me that they do ECOGs every single day. And in fact, I have some practices that do ECOGs constantly, daily, and they don't remember the last time they did an ABR. And that's because they have a doctor who uh, orders it all the time on all of their uh, vestibular patients. Anybody who's there for a, a balance symptom or a dizziness symptom gets a battery of tests and one of the things they get is an ECOG. And of course, um, they don't want to do this with trans tympanic needle electrodes, so they're doing it with tip trodes. And very often, people in clinics like that say, well, we do these all the time, and so many of our results are terrible. Uh, and, you know, we very seldom get a good, clean, clear ECOG. Well, uh, the best ECOG I ever got is that one. Uh, and that's actually 0.6 microvolts. 0.6 microvolts is uh, an extremely high amplitude for uh, an action potential. You see the summating potential. Uh, let's see if this laser works. And you can hardly see it on there. But you can see the summing potential here and the action potential up here. And the total amplitude of this thing, 0.6 microvolts, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, and recorded this uh, in just 
a couple of minutes, very easily, very repeatable, and uh, I haven't been able to duplicate that with that clarity and that amplitude on any other piece of equipment. And to show you that I'm not autologically perfect anymore, there's my audiogram on, on that ear. In fact, that, that was a couple of years ago. It might be a little bit worse by now. I've passed 65, and that's the magic number, officially a senior citizen. But anyway, so we feel pretty confident in selling this to that market that uses uh, ECOG with tip trodes. I just make sure that I use the small, the small tip trode, and I get a, as deep as possible an insertion. Uh, and with good impedance, and a cooperative patient, uh, you can really get excellent looking ECOGs on this. And the reason for it is the way they do their signal processing, which is different than conventional instrumentation. And I'll, I'll show you why that is. Here's a cervical vamp. Uh, no problems doing cer cervical vamps. In fact, we just installed one of these in Children's Hospital here in Birmingham. Uh, and we were doing cervical vamps and ocular vamps. And um, the cervical vamp should never be a problem on any piece of equipment, and it's no problem on this. The, the only thing is this has an automatic gain control where you don't have to readjust the gain when you're doing vamps. Usually you have to turn the gain way, way down for a vamp, otherwise you'll saturate the preamplifier because this response is much bigger than the other responses that we measure, like ABR or ECOG. And, uh, but this has automatic gain control, so you don't, even do, you don't do anything. You just run it. And within just 100 stimuli, uh, you get a good repeatable VEMP response, uh, provided that the patient can do the task. And what we do is we have them lie supine, and then raise their head so that they can see their entire foot as their legs are pied, uh, and then turn their head away from the stimulus uh, 90 degrees for a maximum contraction of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And of course, we do that on both sides and make sure it repeats. This is an ipsilateral response. In fact, you can see the contralateral uh, part of that right there. Uh, because this is a two-channel instrument, the Vivo Sonic equipment used to be just one channel. This generation two is, is of course, two channels. And then we did an OVEMP. OVEMPs are rather difficult to collect on most equipment, uh, but there's OVEMPs on both sides uh, on myself, and I compared it with what I got on uh, the other commercially available equipment, and I got this easier. This is only 300 stimuli. And the reason why you have to be able to do this fast is because during this test, the patient is looking up at the ceiling. And if you look up just as high as you can on the ceiling, maybe you give them a target to look at, give them a center target, and then say, okay, now look up at the target on the ceiling. Don't move your head, just your eyes, and keep looking at that. And you've got to hold that. That's not that easy to do, because you're really straining to look up that much. So you've got to, before the patient fatigues, you've got to get this over with. Uh, well, this is only 300, only 300 stimuli, and I only had to run one response, not repeat it. I never had to repeat it because, remember, it runs these two waves in the background, and all you've got to do is, is push the icon for that when you, uh, when you want to see repeatability, and you can superimpose them like that, and of course, that's very repeatable. And it looks better in a shorter amount of time than I've been able to get for an OVAMP. Anybody who's done them knows that that's not an easy thing to record. That's with electrodes as close as I can get them, the two negative electrodes, as close as I can get them to the eyes. Uh, and then on the chin, I put the one positive electrode that's positive for both channels and ground on the forehead. Seems to work the best, and it's the easiest way to do it. Tone bursts, a lot of people have trouble with tone bursts. Now, yes, this is 4,000 hertz, which is the easiest one to do, but uh, I've, got, I've got excellent and cleaner, quicker uh, tone burst responses than I could get with any piece, conventional piece of equipment. 
So we're having a lot of success with this, and I, I think that that company has really done a good job of uh, really refining their signal processing to a point where it now is pretty much superior. And why is that? The way they do their processing, they call it uh, SOAP adaptive processing. It's SOAP stands for Adaptive Processing Signal to Noise Optimated, uh, Optimized uh, Adaptive Processing. Signal to Noise Optimized Adaptive uh, Processing. And that, that uh, makes all the difference. It also has something called Kalman filtering in it. It never has artifact rejection. So you don't have to ever say, like a lot of people who run ECOGS do, I get all artifacts, I get all artifacts. This never gets artifacts. Because it analyzes every response. And you're doing somewhere between 10 and 50 stimuli per second. And for each stimuli, you're collecting a sample. And you're, and you're adding that sample to the average unless it exceeds a certain amplitude and then you're rejecting it saying, oh, that's a myogenic artif artifact. That can't be part of the response because it's too big. Well, we never do that with Kalman filtering. What we do is take every single sample and analyze the sample for its signal to noise ratio. If it has good signal to noise ratio, then it, uh, it contributes a lot of weight to the average. If it doesn't have good signal to noise ratio, then it contributes only a little bit of weight to the average. Uh, so that's a very smart way to do it. There's no artifacts. It's just that every sample is, uh, is analyzed for how clean it is. Uh, and this is what makes it possible to actually do uh, non-sedated pediatric ABRs with this. They, they said they've been doing this from the very beginning. And in the beginning, when this instrument first hit the market, it really was not so good. They said you could do non-sedated pediatric ABRs with it. And some doctors bought it, and they told their audiologists, we're going to do non-sedated pediatric ABRs on all these kids. And some of the kids were, weren't appropriate because they're running down the hall, pulling the electrodes off during the test. So they're not appropriate. Uh, uh, the only ones that are appropriate, you have to distinguish are the ones that would sit relatively still and quiet. Uh, but uh, now with all of the changes they made, and especially with the Generation 2 product, that is viable on a certain population of pediatric patients, not all pediatric patients. Uh, so it has to be used properly. But at least it is a viable possibility. Uh, but much better handling of myogenic artifacts than the, a conventional piece of equipment, and clearer waveforms in less time, uh, just because of the way that it does its processing. Never have to adjust the gain, never have to worry about signal saturation or, or artifact rejection. Another, uh, another unique thing about this is what they call the amplitrode. That is a special electrode that actually, this is it, right? Let's see if I get this laser to work. It's not so good. Uh, right here, that's the ground electrode. And you see that on this patient's forehead. Uh, it's the lower of the two electrodes. Well, that ground electrode has the preamp built right into the connector. The preamp is built right into the connector. Because usually, the response from the patient has to travel down electrode leads. And as it travels down the electrode leads, it picks up noise, electric, electromagnetic induction noise. So you go into certain environments, like uh, the intensive care nursery, uh, or the OR in many situations, the operating room, or you, you, you go to uh, even some private offices, and you can't collect with a conventional piece of equipment because there's too much electrical interference in that environment. And everybody that's done evoke potential has, has run into that. But you never have a problem with electrical interference uh, with this, at least I haven't. And we purposely created very hostile electrical environments. And for two reasons, this gets away with it. This amplitrode uh, eliminates the signal from the patient having to uh, actually travel down the electrode leads, which just act as antennas picking up environmental electrical interference. And it's also wireless and battery operated. 
So it's not plugged into the electrical system, which is another source of interference. So it really can go to a lot of places where a conventional evoke potential equipment can't go. You get good, clean signals even in intensive care nurseries, operating rooms, and other hostile environments. Then they also have a conventional, a conventional uh, preamp where the patient that you can clip onto the patient and use conventional electrodes. But they were very careful with the design of this. This is fully shielded, and even those electrode leads are shielded with very, very tightly wound shielding. And uh, and I did a comparative analysis between the amplitrode and how it would perform in very hostile electrical environments and this, which they call a vivo amp, uh, in those same environments, and I found no difference. Uh, so this new amplifier is, uh, is very, very good, and it's very, very clean and, con and convenient to use.